Welcome back, beautiful tri-state area. You're listening to a moment of Zen right here on 710 WOR, the voice of New York iHeartRadio. I'm your host, Zen Sams. April is Autism Awareness Month, a time when we amplify the voices of families, researchers, and clinicians working tirelessly to support the more than one in 36 children in the U.S. diagnosed with autism, and that's according to the latest data from the CDC. Today, we're going to be joined by a groundbreaking force in the world of developmental neuroscience, Dr. Robert Melillo. He's a clinician, a professor, a brain researcher, and the best-selling author of Disconnected Kids, which is now in its third edition and translated into 16 languages. But more than anything, Dr. Melillo is a change maker. He's the creator of the Melillo Method and co-founder of Brain Balance Achievement Centers, where his work focuses on rewiring the brain through non-invasive multimodal approaches. His focus, not managing symptoms, but addressing root causes. And that includes autism spectrum disorders. This conversation is going to be brought to you by Your Home TV, committed to delivering meaningful programming that inspires families everywhere. Today, we're chatting rewiring autism. Can the brain change the diagnosis? A powerful look at how brain-based interventions are reshaping our understanding of autism spectrum disorders. Welcoming now to the show is the incredible Dr. Robert Melillo. Welcome, superstar. Thank you, thank you. Thank you, Zen. I'm excited to be here. So excited to have you on. So Dr. Melillo, today we see an autism diagnosis happening earlier than ever with children being screened as young as 18 months. And while early intervention is crucial, many parents feel truly overwhelmed by the medical jargon and limited to behavioral therapies. But your work points to a different starting place, the brain. So can you walk us through what's actually happening neurologically in a child with autism? One of the things that's not happening in the vast majority is there is no damage or injury in the brain. There is no genetic mutation most of the time. Those things are misconceptions. Um, and really, it starts with that you know from my experience everyone that's on the autism spectrum whether they range from high functioning to non-speaking which is the majority of what we work with they really have these genius level skills every one of them in especially their left brain skills and so what the problem is is actually this developmental immaturity delay and imbalance that starts in early childhood um, and that creates this developmental imbalance between the right and left hemisphere networks, and there's not the proper communication that should happen. So it's really just a, a deviation of normal growth, and, and that can be changed, actually. Wow, that's fascinating. So instead of seeing autism as purely behavioral, you're saying it's more about how different areas of the brain are or aren't communicating with each other, and, and that's a totally different lens. And so it's empowering for parents to, to hear this perspective. Now, I'm going to move on to a, st a stat. The CDC notes that boys are nearly four times more likely to be diagnosed with autism than girls. Mm -hmm. But many experts say girls often go undiagnosed because they present differently, more internalized symptoms, if you will, and stronger masking behaviors, if not. So what does the science say here? Is this a brain-based difference between genders? Yeah, there's definitely a brain-based difference between genders, but it also has to do with the way that it's all about brain development. And, and again, it, it all comes down to neurology and neuroscience. It's not, these are not behavioral issues. They're not psychological. They are neuroscience, neuroanatomy issues, and they start in development. And boys and girls' brains differ greatly. When we start out, what most people don't realize is that the basic blueprint of the body and the brain is a female. And then we need to be converted to the male brain by the right amount of hormones at the right time. Um, and anything that may, you know, that means that the boys' brains are more vulnerable. Males tend to be a little bit more right brain dominant and dependent than, than females. Women have, uh, in general, female brains have a larger, what we call corpus callosum, and they have a more symmetrical brain. And they tend to have naturally better communication between brain networks, and they tend to multitask a little bit better than male brains. But also, because these are developmental delays um, and immaturity, the, the male brain normally takes longer to mature. So now if we have anything that interferes with that development, it has more of an impact on a male brain than a female brain. And so that's why, you know, we believe we're seeing a lot more males than females, but it doesn't mean it doesn't happen in females because it does. 
Now, you've worked with thousands of children in families. One of the most controversial but intriguing ideas you've put forth is that autism, in some cases, can be reversed or significantly improved. And that statement challenges conventional thinking. So what does the data behind your method actually show? And how can you define, quote unquote, reversal in this context? We especially work with a lot of non-speaking individuals. And obviously, you know, understanding why they don't speak. That's been one of my really searches for the last 25 years. No one's ever really answered that. What is actually preventing them from speaking when certain areas of their brain seem to be, you know, overactive, like causing tics or stimming behavior or hyperactivity or OCD or increase with, you know, maybe sometimes aggression or anger or certain anxieties or all of those things are overactive when they may have deficits in the right side of the brain, which make them less connected to their body. They don't feel things quite as much at the, at the non-speaking end of it. And that really is the source of them not being able to speak. They have all the words there, but they can't get it out. So, you know, when we talk about changing this, um, you know, there's all different varieties. Again, when we have really high functioning people that are on the autism spectrum, you know, many of them feel, listen, I'm good. I don't need any help. And that's great. And they're brilliant people and they're good. That's fine. But, you know, when you have individuals that can't speak, can't communicate, um, and we find ways of being able to spell with them on a letter board. And it's cr really remarkable because many of these kids that Sometimes they don't think they even know how to recognize a letter. And then when they can spell on a letter board or sometimes an iPad or some other device, they may know full sentences or actually be fully verbal. And they tell us, you know, please help me speak. I want to speak so badly or I want to stop stimming. I want to stop ticking. So the fact is we can change all of that because there is no damage. There is no injury. The fact that people say that you can't do anything about it is because they don't know how the brain works. I've spent my whole career really understanding it. So I think I understand it as well as anybody. I've researched it, written about it, and also work with tens of thousands of, of kids. And, you know, it can be changed. But really, it's up to them and their family as to, you know, what they want to do about it. And we're not trying to change them. We're just trying to bring out the best version of that individual. And if there are certain things there that have interfered with their normal development of their brain and caused these imbalances, then as wonderful and as amazing as they are, what we see is not the best version of them. And we just want to bring that out and not and what we're able to do quite often is not take away their genius, but give them their voice. And, and I think everybody would agree that it's a wonderful thing if we can do that. That's beautiful. You just made me tear up because you said something that was extremely impactful when a child says to you, please help me speak. I mean, that just floored me as a mom right there. And you see this all day, every day. And the only way they're communicating, please help me speak is through that device that otherwise wouldn't have been there if we weren't as advanced in technology. So imagine how isolated these poor children feel. And what's incredibly hopeful but grounded is that it's all about this neuroplasticity, which we know is a very real phenomenon, right? And it's important for parents to understand that like change doesn't have to mean perfection. It can just mean progress. Now, parents often ask, you know, what caused this? And, and while genetics certainly play some level of role. So many environmental factors are now under the microscope. So you've talked about the role of immune function and inflammation and even gut health. What's the most compelling link between these symptoms and the development of autism spectrum disorders in your, in your perspective? Yeah, the most compelling link is that, you know, this is definitely driven by environmental factors. It's not genetic mutations. Um, and, you know, so that's why it is, it is changeable. We can change that gene expression uh, because the genes aren't damaged. But again, the misconception that it also starts in the gut and it starts with inflammation is not correct. It actually starts in the brainstem. It starts in the brain and it starts with maturity and the imbalance of what we call the sympathetic and parasympathetic nervous system. And this leads to work that I've done and I've published more than anybody in the world right now on something called retained primitive reflexes. So these are reflexes that we're all born with that should be there even before we're born that help the baby develop in the first year. And, you know, the human brain is unique. Our brain is the only brain in the, on the planet that 80% of our development happens outside of the womb. No other animal has to do that. And so how we go through the development, looking at those milestones 
you know, during this during during the pandemic, the CDC was actually getting much more lax with that and saying it doesn't matter. Kids develop at all different ages and all different ways. And it doesn't matter if they crawl unusual, or they don't crawl or they skip crawling or if they walk late. That's not true. It really should be very strict. So paying attention to that, looking at those early milestones. Um, we have a paper coming out this month that is going to be coming out in a major pediatric clinical journal where we're, you know, they asked us to write a paper on the fact that looking at these things called retained reflexes and how they relate to milestones as a biomarker of neurodevelopmental issues, which means that we can now recognize these things really in, in, early on. The first the first milestone is, can the baby latch on if the mom decides to breastfeed? And, and if they don't, right off the bat, there, we, we might see a red flag and be able to intervene really, really early. Now, April is all about awareness, but awareness without direction can sometimes leave families feeling really stuck. So if a parent listening right now is just dealing with that new diagnosis or feels their child is struggling with these developmental delays, what's one first step you recommend they take toward better understanding the brain behind the behavior? Really just, you know, trying to educate yourself on actually looking at brain and brain science and neuroscience, because you're going to hear a lot of things. You're going to hear that, you know, nobody knows what's going on. You go, no one's even going to tell you that most, the first question I ask most families when they come all over the world to New York here to see me is, has anybody tried to explain to you what's happening in your child's brain? The answer is always no. And the reason why is because they don't know. And yet, you know, they'll tell you, but there's nothing you can do about it, even though they don't know what the problem is. Um, and that's what drove me on this was my own son was diagnosed with ADHD. And I went out and wanted to search as to what the answer was. And I already knew a lot about neurology and the brain. And people kept on saying, well, we don't know what it is, but we know there's nothing you can do about it. So the idea is to really understand that these are neurological developmental issues um, and people will say there's nothing you can do about it, but that's not true. Um, and it's not that it's easy and it's not that it's not frustrating and scary. And a lot of people will be told, well, listen, just learn to accept it. This is it. This is your fate in life. And, you know, and, yeah. and just come to that acceptance point. And I understand it's not that we don't want to accept these individuals and these children and people for who they are because they're amazing. But um, I would say that, you know, I, I don't think acceptance is really the way to go. I think there are things that can be really, really helpful. And I think reading my book would be a really good first step. We've included a lot of our new research. And again, we published papers on this in the best journals in the world and showed that, you know, we can change these things and we can actually see differences in the brain before and after. So, you know, don't don't lose hope, um, you know, educate yourself, understanding that it is a brain issue and learn more about it and then, you know, seek out the right help. That's such practical, calming advice, especially for parents in that panic phase, you know, after a diagnosis, knowing that there's a path forward and that it starts with curiosity about your child's brain is everything. Now we have about a minute left and I want to touch on my last question. You and your wife, Carolyn, created a series called Disconnected Kids, Reconnected Families, and it's racked up over 3 million views this year alone. The emotional toll this journey takes on families is is so real. So what have you learned about the healing that happens, not just neurologically, but emotionally, when families start this work together? Obviously, for the child itself, especially in, in a kid, let's say, that's locked in a body that they can't control or feel or move, and they're geniuses, and they're brilliant, and nobody knows it. But also for the parent, you know, the uh, parent once said to me, you know, we gave up on the Harvard dream years ago. And you know, all those dreams that parents have. And it's very difficult for both. So lots of times when we're working, what we've learned is that we take care of the parents and the child at the same time. Um, and it can be really helpful. But the fact is, you know, if we address the root cause, if we really deal with the issue, if we can resolve, these people have also become incredibly resilient. And many yeah. of these ki kids are incredibly, you mentioned something before about self-regulation. Self-regulation and resilience is really a byproduct of right hemisphere development, as is attachment. And we see that anybody that has, you know, trauma or anybody that has problems with emotional regulation, they have issues with especially right brain function and development. And <clears throat> when we change that, it changes resilience and it can heal trauma and it can help with emotional regulation. And sometimes that's the only way to do it, because if there is an imbalance in the brain, 
you can teach them all they want. You can try all the behavioral. All you're doing is managing symptoms or managing behaviors, and you're not really dealing with the core issue. So, you know, those are things that we can, if we really overcome the issue, then people bounce back pretty quickly and they, and they can get into a really good space, both for the whole family. Beautifully said. It's not just about the child. It's truly about reuniting and strengthening the entire family system. And when families feel less alone, well, everything changes, right? So exactly. we are officially out of time. We've gone so over the, the clock, but I, I love talking to you and I could just do, I could do this all day because you're so brilliant and, and you, you explain things so well. And I learn every time you come on the show, I learn something. Well, thank you very much. It's a pleasure to talk to you too. If you want to learn more, I want you to head to drmelillo.com. Definitely, without a doubt, check his book out, Disconnected Kids. It's now it's in third edition. You can follow him on the gram at Dr. Robert Melillo. It's two L's at the end. And listen to the Melillo Method podcast, Everything Brain on all major platforms. And remember, awareness is the first step, but action is what actually creates transformation. You're listening to a moment of Zen right here on 710 WOR, the voice of New York iHeartRadio. We'll be right back after this. A moment of Zen is brought to you by Your Home TV with Kathy Ireland and their channel partners. Head to yourhometv.com for free, family friendly programming streaming 24 7. Disconnected Kids Reconnected Families is a documentary style reality series providing an in home look at families who have children in need of intervention for conditions ranging from behavioral issues and oppositional defiance to autism and ADHD. Watch as Dr. Robert Melillo and his wife Carolyn go into the home and get real with the families. Using decades of experience, they help families not only face the issues head on, but also overcome their challenges and reconnect as a family. Exclusively on Your Home TV Network. Tune in to A Moment of Zen, Saturday nights from 9 to 10 p.m. on 710 WOR, the voice of New York.